There he is. Cool. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the third episode of Three DMs in a Tavern. Uh, with me today, as normal, are Spyglass and Lance. Say hi. Hello. Hello. And joining us at the table today, we have a special guest. Uh, introduce yourself, Luke. Hi, I'm Luke. I DM uh, another podcast. Uh, it's called Trials and Trebuchets. It's set out of a magical school, and it's real fun. Check it out if you feel like it. And I'm here today to sit at this proverbial table with these fun people. Yeah, yeah, the proverbial table is as big as you need it to be with whatever drink you want to imagine. <clears throat> <laughs> and so, uh, I guess we'll get started with the questions uh, submitted by both the Frostwalker server and the Trials and Trebuchet server. Uh, do we want to so, get a bit of, sorry, I was just no, 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 thinking out loud here. Um, <clears throat> you want to give a little bit more background on your DMing experience, Luke? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, absolutely. So I've, since I was probably about 12 years old, although not that, the entire time of that was not super serious. I played with my brothers when we were younger, when, like, we found my dad's old D&D &D stuff from when he was a kid and just kind of skimmed it. And then we're like, we know how to play. And since they always wanted to play, I was always forced to DM. Um, so I've been a perma DM since birth, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, <laughs> I've gotten to play I... a few times. Uh, I've run a few campaigns that have been like, I've been playing seriously. I've been playing 5th edition seriously since about um, 2015 with the current group I play with on Trials and Trebuchets podcast. Um, but before that, it was kind of off and on with 3.5 and 4th edition. So... What I'm saying is uh, my experience is kind of limited to just Dungeons and Dragons, but it has been for multiple uh, of this. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. I'd like to say that any of that the three of us collectively have as much experience, but that would be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know. It's not a super ton of experience. Most of the stuff I did when I was a kid was literally just like, oh, let's make a map and then come up with it on the fly. Like twice a Hell year yeah. so. wait you, wait that's not what we that's not what we're supposed to do already that's not what <laughs> there's we're more already? to dming than improv <laughs> oh crap <laughs> god we're fucked <laughs> we're so unqualified okay we can't we can't post this now yeah no. <laughs> they'll know we're all frauds <laughs> okay uh, <clears throat> so the first Yo. Oh, what a perfect ahead. what a perfect segue to this question holy shit i can't i can't imagine a better segue Rio asks, <clears throat> well, they asked bluntly about other systems. Like, have we had any experience with other uh, tabletop systems, and which ones have we enjoyed besides Dungeons & Dragons? Yeah, are there any systems outside of 5e that you think look neat, is his question. So I finally actually got to play a little bit of Microscope with uh, some mm. peeps from World Anvil, and it was very interesting. It's, it's basically like... Spore the tabletop? <laughs> <laughs> no, but actually, kind of a good comparison, but it's more like it's more like you are your DM, and you're simultaneously a player. Like, you have a bunch of DMs all, all DMing at once, and co-DMing. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, I didn't get to play all that much, but it was, it was a very, very unique experience. Yeah, hmm. I've heard about it, uh, people playing Microscope in the past to, like, flesh out world history because you play as like you go through history and like minor events and major events occur to my knowledge i've never played right it myself. yeah um it's very history focused it's very yeah. like lore it sounds, focused it sounds like a really fun way to world build in like a <clears throat> with a group um but i've never done it personally but it, it does interest me and i have heard about it it sounds like really cool um regards to other systems the genesis role-playing system from Fantasy Flight Games is A+. plus. I don't know if any of you guys have ever had experience with that. I've um, heard of it. Mm -hmm. I have not. It's so... It uses these weird dice that don't have numbers. They have kind of... it's it, To boil it down, it's essentially like merit and demerit. So there's a couple different like things that kind of cancel each other out. And so like you'll make a check based on... And you'll add dice based on however many skill you have in a specific area and then you'll add bad dice based on how many or how difficult the check is and then kind of roll them and then like cancel off any of like the 
positives and negatives. So you can like succeed with a bunch of threats. And then everyone at the table comes up with like, what are those threats? Or like you can fail, but you can have advantages. So you can fail your way to success and stuff. And it's like a super collaborative kind of very improvised because like the situation you're in, like you can be in a combat and it's like the situation is constantly changing based on like someone will just get like eight success or eight um advantages and then you get to come up with a bunch of stuff that just goes your way and i haven't had a chance to play it but i've read a bunch of the source books and listened to a few people play it and it's it's like i don't know it jives with me i think that's really cool <clears throat> that's cool. that well, is very interesting it was one of my options oh. for um so a while back i had uh, an idea of maybe running a game of some kind set in the diaspora universe which for those of you who don't know what that is it is um one of my major settings it's a hard science fiction world and it is currently the setting of my other podcast a scripted anthology called starhopper radio mm -hmm. that i got um, to be a voice actor on yeah yep. oh. and lance will be very soon and yeah I'll, be a, I'll have a writing <laughs> credit very soon <laughs> But uh, Genesis was one of the options that I had as an RPG system for the Diaspora. It's not exactly what I was looking for, but it's it's definitely among the top three options. Oh, okay. What what else were you looking for? Or were looking um, at? I was also looking at Traveler and uh, Diaspora, which is ironically, it, it's just very fitting that there is a, a TTRPG system called Diaspora mm -hmm. for a world called the Diaspora. Um, <laughs> but it was it was among the top three. Lance, you got any others besides D and D that you've done? Yeah, actually, um, I've I've played uh, Monster of the Week. Oh. Hell yeah! Which was super fun. Uh, that was it was definitely different. Not having you know your your set of seven dice, but yeah. <clears throat> and only having a d six. That was that was weird. But then also I played one recently. Uh, that was kind of similar to Monster of the Week, but it was uh, called Honey Heist. Oh, <gasps> yes. Mm hmm I think Avon told a little bit about this. That was a super crack, super fun uh, campaign. You're play you play as bears. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you Wait, literally so know nothing. finally no play Craig? <laughs> Well, see, the thing is, is you have to roll to find out, like, you roll a d6 <laughs> to find out what kind of bear you are, uh, what your demeanor is, what your like role is. So I ended up rolling a uh, incompetent panda hacker, <laughs> oh my God. God. who did pretty much nothing but ate his way into debt at the Honeycon 2019. While the rest of his crew was off trying to steal the honey, he found a uh, honey-filled bamboo. And that was the end of that. So, but that was a really fun one. Um, it was it was a little different. You only roll one d six. You have two uh, two separate sections. You have a thief section and a bear section, and you start out with three in uh, each section. And when you want to do something that is thief related, like sneaking around, you know, trying to open a lock or something, you have to roll a three or under. And if you get a three or under, you, you succeed. But if you get a four or above, you have to remove one of your thief points and put it in bear. Oh. Hmm. And if you reach six on either side of your thief or your bear, you lose the game. That's interesting. So you kind of have to balance things you're doing so that you don't go full thief or so you don't go full bear. Exactly. So that's fun. That sounds really fun. It's yes. interesting that... Sorry, it's interesting that um, there are win lose conditions in a tabletop RPG because normally, normally it's very open about that. Like D and D, there is no winning D and D. That's not a thing. Um, yeah, unless apparently. you make your dungeon master cry. <laughs> God, that, that, if that's the case, my crew makes wins every single round. <laughs> if making your dungeon master just give up is the win condition for D and D. Then my my players won in the fucking test session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a rule somewhere. If you start reading the player's handbook backwards, <laughs> upside down, it actually says you win the game if you make your DM facepalm, cry, or give up. 
<laughs> oh, my favorite. DM one. no longer stands for Dungeon Master. What the <laughs> hell was that? I am so sorry. That was my cat. She wanted to say hi. Cat. I thought you were murdering a baby on the podcast. <laughs> No, that's just my cat. <laughs> Fuck. Dungeon Master, or DM no longer stands for Dungeon Master. It stands for Dead Man. <laughs> yep. Confirmed. Oh. So, like, I like Urban Shadows quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Urban you played Shadows that is pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I played a, I played a werewolf son of a bitch named Aurelio. I love him the pieces. Um, oh, there was... sorry, not just like. No, it's okay. There's, 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 there's stuff going on in the podcast right now with a, a, Aurelio. Huh. And that just gave me like nightmares. Thanks, Debbie. <laughs> uh, well, uh, <clears throat> I'll have all Aurelio really did was he was the muscle of the team, which didn't say much, um, and he liked tagging his partner's white van that she used to keep stealthy with all the jokes you can imagine about a white van. Oh, God. Yeah, he's the one who would write free candy on the side of her white van, oh. and she hated every second of it. <laughs> um, so, uh, Urban Shadows is fun. Monster of the Week. Uh, I'm a nerd. There's a Doctor Who one that I've been eyeing. Okay, <laughs> but, I'm just, but that's just because I'm a fucking nerd. Um, <clears throat> oh my god. See, thank you. You've reminded me that there is, in fact, a Star Wars tabletop RPG system. There yes. are several. There are. That's I always the, forget about that. That's the, what There the are Genesis also Pokemon ones, yeah. too. There are Pokemon yeah. ones, and we need to do that someday. There's this is news to me. The Pokemon There's... ones are really difficult. I was going to run a mystery dungeon-style one-shot for my friends um, for, as like a graduation party for a few of them, and it was just impossible for me to find it wasn't impossible it was just very time consuming for me because they made a bunch of stuff and the system was kind of a bit you know Bloated. crunchy so like to at the point in time where people are writing exams and stuff it was just kind of difficult to be like hey everyone go read this 60 page document of just weird rules that are you know really well different. yeah and then let's mm -hmm. play it after I spend a couple hours uh, on like every night just homebrewing some stuff for it. And I was just like, I don't think this will be fun. We should just play regular D and D so that everyone knows what they're doing. Yeah, I need to find an easier Pokemon because <sighs> because it's, it's, it's Pokemon. <laughs> okay, so I do have one other one that I, I was gonna keep secret because I am ashamed of it, and it was my first actually ever slightly tabletop game lance you know we can never you, you can you can never say anything uh, i'm tempting the fates <laughs> you are so back when i was 20 which was a long ass time ago mm -hmm. uh we got invited to go play vampires of the masquerade mm -hmm. oh that one's i've heard good things about vampires but of the it was a larp oh in a college. Mm. And we got there and everybody was dressed up. Ooh. Wait, did and they tell you it was a LARP? We didn't know what to expect. We were newbie nerds. And... So you didn't know what LARP meant. <laughs> well, we, we knew what LARP meant. But we weren't sure what to expect. Mm -hmm. And so we're they sat us down. How and put, hard they would go. Yeah, yeah. They, they put you know, the character sheet in front of us, and they're like, fill this out! And then they ran off, and we're like, yeah. uh... I guess I'm a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how you do this? But that was my first ever experience with uh, Vampires of the Masquerade. I would like to give it another shot, maybe at a table this time. Okay, so jumping over to the Trials of Trebuchet server, Avery asks one question pretty loaded for luke and another one i think we can all answer so yeah luke your 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 individual bullet is why a magic school? i think that could be extended even even better to like why could you why do you pick the specific setting you, you like like spy that's fair made a reference to like a hard sci-fi um like yeah. a fictional what is it what's the word i'm looking for narrative like podcast mm. 
as opposed to um like star like fantasy yeah. yeah as opposed to me who i'm like oh i want to play a bunch of nerds in like a magic school right so i just i'm interested to like why do you guys choose the settings you choose fair enough but yeah. i mean the bull the, the bull is primed at you my friend okay you, i'll answer lead us out then. lead us out yeah so i chose a magic <clears throat> school so the general the way i do campaigns is i make i have a bunch of ideas like even now running one campaign i have a bunch of ideas for future things that i want to do right like that's just the nature of i think being creative and trying to run games yeah you when you're a dm you come up with good characters and when you're a player you come up with good campaigns exactly <laughs> um so i made a selection of like five or six different campaign settings or i guess campaign settings is not the right word but campaign topics of like do you guys want to be characters like this or characters like that and one of them was let's all be um like students at a magical academy and that was the one everyone gravitated towards and i was th i came up to me because like it just seems like i don't know at the time it felt like a fairly fun it's just something i had never done like i'd had schools in settings before that i just never really worked with like it was just like oh it's just a regular academy that people go to right and i tried previously to do even like an adventurer's academy as like a horror um thing and that was like that i consider as one of my biggest failures ever as a dm like it was absolutely horrible so i don't know i just kind of wanted to do it and do it well and it just allowed like having a mat like having your base thing be magic is like oh magic it's everywhere and it's cool it's just a very fun liberating kind of like you can do anything with that and that's probably what i why i was like oh this sounds really fun i can't say for certain why all my players uh chose that as the campaign but i'm having a fun blast so far and it just lets me fair enough <clears throat> lance what made you do space uh okay so as i've said before uh, Space Days actually started out as a one-shot mm -hmm. that I just really wanted to play. I contacted some people in the Lawful Stupid Discord and was like, hey, you guys want to play? And our closest friends was like, yeah. And by the end of the one-shot, they're like, no, we have to keep going. So oh, that you. started everything there. But I think I chose Space and mainly because... I have a backlog in my brain mm. of ideas and worlds and I love world building uh -huh. and being able to give my players that option of going to different worlds that are completely different from each other, experiencing new monsters, characters, you know, creatures. Yeah, you never, and you inherently don't have to dive as deep as one would because you get to be as vast as, as vast as you want. So you can kind of whirlwind tour through your hi highlight reel of ideas. <clears throat> yeah and it's like you know i have i have a file of monsters and i'll go through there and i'll be like oh this looks like this looks like an ice monster let's put this on an ice planet and cool. you know let's let's do this and it, it seems to have worked out really well they get to experience something new and uh different each time they go to a different planet mm -hmm. and even just going through through the vast space it's there's always something that happens like be it a space battle or a giant space eel oh. <laughs> space eel <laughs> <laughs> all right um spy i know well you could talk about both starhopper and uh and the escape artists if you want i mean i feel kind of out of place talking about starhopper on a, a, a rpg podcast mm. because starhopper is a scripted anthology series that has nothing to do with rpgs but it's fair. it still has um, a requisite amount of world building and thought of what the setting is though i so i think that's kind of fair game fair enough i mean like i just actually put up a new story project uh in in the diaspora universe so it's more than just um the setting for one thing it's mm -hmm. this, the diaspora itself exists outside of the stories that uh are set in it uh in that respect i guess it's more like our world you know where 
things happen, but in the end, it's it's all one big fucking universe. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just I've been working on the the roots of the the diaspora started oh fucking twenty fourteen. So that's what Five. four years ago. Yeah, over four, four years, five, five, yeah, five years ago. Yeah, I can um, math. <laughs> It'll be, it'll be five this October, um, but uh, more recently it's become it's expanded from just one planet to uh, like a sixty light year diameter chunk of space, mm-hmm. um, and I mean I'm an astrobiologist by major that's like my career path, mm-hmm. so space has always been a an important thing for me, and the reason that the diaspora is what it is is because in all of my exploration of hard science fiction interstellar the martian arthur c clark etc especially the cyberpunk genre Mm -hmm. i've never really seen anything outside of like carl sagan's pale blue dot that explores the happier potential of sci-fi i mean interstellar kind of but it starts with a dystopia you know it Mm -hmm. starts with the earth is dying yeah whereas in the diaspora the whole point is like it's it's the good timeline it's where humans shape their shit up and start getting along and and commit to their goal of exploring space exploring Mm -hmm. the universe and so i wanted to take that the spirit of you know carl sagan's bright optimism for the future and apply it to realistic science fiction um and so from there, it's just become this big, big universe. There are 270 different star systems, most of which have planets, a good chunk of which are inhabited. Um, and so there's just this big universe that is open to ex- exploration, um, not only for me, I mean, I'm the one who makes it, but um, other people are welcome to explore it as well. Like, that's sort of the reason I built it. Mm-hmm. And as for my rpg stuff the reason that the escape artist came about well will be coming about there's a a story there but uh essentially one of my friends who is has been a D player for years now said hey um you're you're a a great world builder you'd probably be a good dm why don't you why don't you dm a, a campaign i'm like okay maybe and then i was messing around on uh on space engine with the, the planet editor and i generated this map and i thought huh looks kind of like uh looks kind of like the planet nern from the elder scrolls series hmm. oh god no I, I can't have another world no no ah shit there it is <laughs> and so i came up with this world map and i started coming up with like lore and stuff and i messaged jason and i go hey you remember what you said about me dming a campaign in a homebrew world and so um I've sort of it started initially as like all right I'm just going to treat this as like a regular um D&D fantasy world with you know all the regular races and regular rules and stuff and then of course because I'm an obsessive world builder it just spiraled from there into okay well this planet orbits a, this planet has three moons and a ring system and it orbits a sun which in turn orbits a massive fucking black hole that is central to the plot and blah 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 blah. <laughs> um, I went and I uh, when I was working on the race pages. I was working on the on the species pages for the World Anvil. I inadvertently, air quotes here. I inadvertently came up with a phylogenetic structure for how all of the humanoid races are related to each other. So even in fantasy, I start applying science. Yeah, I feel, <laughs> I feel you on that one. I have a really strong like geography geology background. So anytime I, I'm like, all right, let's build this world. I'm like, well, this just has to be this way. Like, there's no other opportunities. And then it just <laughs> falls into me being like, well, let me check my textbook so that it could be like, oh, let me just check if see if this is like all right. And I'm like, this is not what I wanted to do. I wanted to make a, a, a silly fantasy world, not sit down and be like, well, how does this? I definitely feel you on that. Always bringing science. And- Hi, I like ice towns because Christmas town is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, equally valid yeah yeah all of you are just giving these long days christmas no uh tim shul started because it kind of just started with an idea and a and a song that played in my head 
And <clears throat> I just had this idea of like the most inad in uninhabitable part of like you know fantasy storytelling. No one ever does like. I would love to have seen if Lord of the Rings was set in like the tundra. I I don't mm. think that there's I I can't think. Skyrim. That's, <clears throat> that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> but like there's it you know there's not that many instances of that. And I was like I love. I love like the the beauty that Arctic settings have, and I'm just an ice person. Like everyone's like, "Yeah, fire magic," and I'm just I'm gonna sit over here with my snowballs and have a time. <laughs> uh, but second. go for it. <clears throat> uh, I'm just, I'll be right back. Yeah, yeah. So what was I gonna say? So like, I just had this idea of this little town in like the very the very corner of the the Arctic. Mm -hmm. uh, that was just like the last, the last bastion of civilization. Everything else around it is pure tundra, and it's just the warmest place where everyone is accepted. <laughs> where like, <laughs> if like if you're an outsider, <laughs> that one was not me this time. <laughs> This is the episode where cats no. take over all all of the podcast. We just put cats to the mic for an hour. Yeah, won't that be quality content, guys? No, but uh... <laughs> yeah, Timishul was just meant to be this really nice place the where you looking asshole. <laughs> <laughs> what do we tell him? He's not muted. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cool. Shut up! <laughs> so, so... <laughs> I'm so sorry to steal your spotlight, B. This is fucking... <laughs> okay. I like Christmas Tony again. <laughs> I don't fucking know, dude. Uh, I've talked about Tim Show a lot in, like, the other episodes, so it's fine. It's fine. Don't even trip. I just... <laughs> I just wanted to make a place where it made sense for any fantasy race to work from D&D, because mm -hmm. I didn't want to limit, like, anyone when we started, and I just mm -hmm. liked the idea of, like, these people may have come from other places, and something happened that made them, like, have to leave or to leave, and they just found this one spot where, no matter, like, what race, what, you know, what you're doing, whatever, like, this is a place where drow and regular have to walk by and have to be like chill with each other, you know? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if I may. And, mm -hmm. Fantasy Canada. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> and like, yeah, that's, that's, that, was the, that was the concept. The second part of the question was to go over our world building process, but I think we already did. That. Yeah. Uh, we kind yeah. of did. We kind yeah. of did in the last episode, yeah. That's true. And I mean, we, we, we talked quite a bit about our individual worlds right now, so. Mm. Uh, my advice for I probably already said this but I'll just reiterate my advice is that um, especially if you're like a, just a writer um, you're building your world for you that's it like mm -hmm. learn to take solace in your world build it how you want to build it mm -hmm. and people who like the same things that you do people who are like minded will come to it that's at least my yeah. that's my philosophy and yeah. in terms of in terms of rpg world building get to know your players a little bit uh at least a little bit um the the more well you know your players the the, the easier it is for you to manage your campaign but get to know your players get to get a feel for what they enjoy and try to tie in as much of those elements as you can so yeah, hopping you... back oh sorry sorry oh. yeah you really can't let uh a lot of criticism get to you when you're creating your worlds like you can take some of the information you get and add it to it but like uh spice said you're doing this for yourself mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. a vivid example i remember is there was a i don't think this this was more of a joking time but uh there was an episode of space days an asteroid feed and <laughs> i remember spy was like 
this is like this is not how asteroid fields work in science but this was fucking cool so who gives a crap oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah i was like i was listening and i'm like all right on the one hand this isn't how asteroids fields work but on the other hand i fucking love the mechanics that lance set up for them like the the whole spacewalk mechanics that lance devised they're just they're really effective i like them yeah it was it was super fun to come up with the like the ship mechanics and the spacewalk mechanics and like how you have to get through space and everything like that it was it was definitely out of my comfort zone i had never done anything like that but like the cells of the ship are probably my baby. That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. <clears throat> so Pixie has one of their many one sentence questions. Teach me how to plot twist. Oh. <laughs> I, be- I believe step one is have a plot to twist. <laughs> like God, you- fuck, shit. I don't have a plot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, uh, I can't uh, do this. You can't go into a plot. You, like, that, I feel like people think that you can go into a story with, or even an RPG, just like, okay, yeah, I'm going to craft a thing that has this one big twist and it's going to be great. Mm-hmm. And then they sit down with that roadmap in mind and you're just like, hmm. <laughs> I feel like it's a bit more natural to be. Like to maybe not worry about that. Not every story needs a big twist, and like, like we said, take solace in the world you build. Like, yeah, you know, like come up with your world, come up with your story, and honestly, the more you sit there, think about your characters and your concepts, it'll just kind of happen. It will. The, the, the more you play, the more falls into place. It's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also, like, don't get so stuck on your plot either yeah like your characters will derail your plot and it'll go off but hopefully you can get them back on like how the dominion lasted like way more episodes you how the dominion was supposed to be a one to two episode thing and it was seven freaking episodes yes (laughs) (laughs) or how like you on blast lance no that's that's fine example i like i actually really enjoyed the dominion arc it was super fun being able to create all those npcs for them to uh get to interact with and kind of the past like interact uh, interactions and <laughs> and the romances that blossomed but uh and it's not gonna be the last time you see the dominion so that's gonna be really fun but also like how the whole thing started out with lost ones tech and they really went off the course of lost ones tech and now they're slowly getting back on. Now they're slowly getting back off. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> one of these days we'll get to the thing I was talking about in episode one. One of these days. Right. One of these days we'll get back to this. But for now... And the plot twists you were like... You're the DM. If you want to have a plot twist that's going to throw your, your characters off... I like to do it at the most random of times. That like, makes sense. Yeah, like there's there's always talk of like the adventure zone or amnesty's tension uh, pension to put it right at the end, and like everyone freaks the fuck out as the music stings. You don't have to do that. No, and it's like okay, it is fun to ha- like end a uh, episode on a cliffhanger. I will admit that I am mm-hmm. very guilty of that. I love doing that dramatic ending that's going to keep people coming back, but uh, you know, like even just in the middle yeah. of a. a a campaign when they're focusing on something else and then they find a little piece of information that completely just throws them off track is super satisfying, especially when you're on Skype and you can see your their faces. <laughs> <laughs> you monster. <laughs> uh, it gives me life. See, I, think- uh, I was just going to say, like, um, you guys have campaigns where the players are interacting with a lot of NPCs. Um, they're in places where there are a lot of NPCs a- available to interact with. Whereas with the escape artists, um, that's not going to be the case for most of the campaign. It's going to be more uh, more Dungeons of Fandelver, or Lost Minds of Fandelver, whatever the fuck it's called, um, where they're in a more remote location, and there's pretty much the only people they'll have to talk to are each other and whatever whatever adversaries they encounter. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Ah, Flapdoodle, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, on the one hand, that gives them a lot more uh, opportunity to get to know each other. Um, in character, I mean. Uh, mm -hmm. As well as out of character. But, um, on the other hand, uh, it's easier for me because... I know what creatures are lurking in these, you know, in the mushroom forest or at the bottom of the ocean trench or whatever. Um, and they don't. Uh, and I liked my plot twists generally uh, are more to do with lore. So like all uh, I have a couple of things planned where I mean, some things that uh, their quest giver told them may not have been as accurate as uh, they were led to believe um, by no fault of said quest giver. Mm -hmm. but. Um, Things aren't always. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the biggest thing is if you're going in for a plot twist, if that's something you want to do, you got to like. It, you got to lay the groundwork for it. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't you gotta make have like, that good foundation. You got to yes. make your players look back and smack their forehead and yes. say, holy shit, how did I miss that? That's right. like yes. the essential part of it is like, it can't be just spur of the moment. It has to be kind of premeditated. You have to know that it's going to happen. And, and you have to know where it's going. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to, you also have and... to be prepared that the players might, like, say you have this really good plot lined up with, like, something and this character. And, like, all they got to do is f*** in that route. And, they're like, you'll start on this path. And they don't go in there. You got to be ready for that. You have yeah. to be prepared for your players to do something that makes you go, wait, well, no, damn. no, come back. Go back. Yeah. I feel like. Fuck, go back. Essential parts of. <laughs> DMing is like you need to learn to like let them do whatever they want. So many times in our podcasts or like the campaigns that I've run previously for the same group of people, I'll be like, oh, look at this great, amazing thing. Like there was a whole. So in a previous campaign we ran, the one of the capital cities had a plague going on, right? And mm -hmm. so there was this whole cult that the party had dealt with previously who are kind of responsible for spreading around this plague and like earlier like very early in the campaign it was like i kind of laid the groundwork of like oh there's gonna be like there's something going wrong and like people are getting sick and such and such right just so that when the plague happened it wasn't gonna be a big deal and then there was they had been working with a people's people at a like a few people a few npcs and one of them was very deeply ingrained with this cult, not that they knew that. And so one of like my, I was like, oh, it's going to be such a great plot. Like, it's going to be so cool when like they storm into this workshop and like find evidence of like this guy that they trust really strongly having like total involvement and being like, like orchestrating this entire plague thing. But then they just never went to the workshop. And never found out that he was in charge of this. Like he, life just continued on, and like that was a really hard thing for me to deal with. Of just like, oh my gosh, like I spent like like I spent so much time and effort to like preparing that, and then they just kind of skipped to the next to the next thing. And I was like, oh, okay, that's not prepared. So let me just come up with some stuff, <laughs> right? Like right, yeah. yeah. Like, and but the thing that's fun is then you get to think about like, oh, now he has more time. Yeah, you know? beat you cut out real bad, dude. <clears throat> really? Is it any better? Me. You're fine for me, yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, jumping back over to the trials and trebuchet server, it was. I want to say that again, dude? <laughs> was that did that cut out bad for everyone this time? No. Uh, the next question is <clears throat> the most. What is the most difficult thing about being a DM? Mm. From Prince. Mm. Your players. <laughs> <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> um, this sort of ties it. This is a good segue. Um, the point that I was going to make is, um, when you're structuring your plot, know your players and know your player character. Build it, like I said, with um, know what your players enjoy in terms of like world building tropes. Know what your player characters are going to do. Mm -hmm. Anticipate their moves. That way you can tie in things that things that they're going to basically you can make your plot hooks more appealing to them instead of just mm -hmm. making them general plot hooks like oh there's a shady guy in the back of the tavern yeah first you have to make sure that they're actually going to go to the tavern <laughs> yeah you yeah you need really need to give them like specific bait for the hooks 
of like, I know this person's going to be interested in this. So I will <laughs> lean into that and like relate everything to that so that if I want to get this person interested, this player and this character interested in what I've laid out before them, I need to know what they're going to be. In and that takes mm -hmm. like just playing with them is really like a good way to figure that out or just like having a simple conversation of like, oh, what do you want out of this game? Like I referenced earlier, I make like a survey for my players of like, which one of these campaigns would you like to play? And then additionally, I like have a conversation with each of them, like, what do you want out of this, right? So just so that I know this is what I should be aiming for when I'm making plot hooks for this person, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. In terms of like difficult things, I have had a long, like my entire DMing experience has been like in person at a table and now mm -hmm. playing mm -hmm. online and having to use like theater of the mind primarily is killing me very slowly it's murdering me mm -hmm. like especially in combats like i've i usually run a fairly i think a fairly heavy combat game and um like that's just part of the game for me and so that involves using a grid and like we're a very fast group when we play in real in like in the meat space and like you can see the grid and everything's happening and it's way easier to narrate and everyone has a very good grasp of where everyone is and so that makes everyone's decision making easier but playing in theater of the mind for me i know that i have a very clear picture of what i'm seeing and trying to convey that to my players is kind of a difficulty and it makes combat drag out really long and to me it kind of like removes any of the tension that has built up you know that's yeah. my primary fair enough <laughs> um, also lance? i need i lance you referenced earlier romance and i need every single tip you have imaginable about how to do romance and not make it whole <laughs> oh <laughs> man i will dm you listen to episode one we talk about it <laughs> <laughs> if you can listen to episode one, <laughs> I I, yeah, I I I did not do great work on that editing, but that that's a story. Anyway, I'll I'll ship you that book that I wrote about DMing and romances. My dude. <laughs> <laughs> Don't use uh, the word ship. <laughs> God damn it! We've re we've reached maximum overship. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if it's something you y'all have ever dealt with in your games that you've run but i oh it's happened we've never in my experience never ever come up ever once and now in the podcast it is and i'm like i don't know how to deal with this oh oh mm -hmm. hey, it, i don't hey, know to hey. me it, it feels weird to like flirt with my friends i feel that mm -hmm. i don't know. you know it's it's one of those things where like you, like you have to lay ground rules mm -hmm. uh, absolutely like i told my characters you know if you want to flirt with an npc that is totally fine it will not go past flirting <laughs> i will stop you there i don't care how good you roll mm -hmm. i mean he could be head over heels for you you know, they, they will tell you anything you want to know if you roll a natural 20, but you will not get them into your bed. Mm. And if you guys want to flirt with each other, go ahead. I'm not going to say anything, but if you get weird, I am cutting it out of the podcast. Yes. Just saying. It's fair. My, yeah, see, my old DM um, did the fade to black mm -hmm. trick, where mm -hmm. if it got that far, he just said, all right, and we cut to yeah. Yeah, whatever exactly. other character. <laughs> Um, it gets it gets a little intense, and you go, okay. So now, what are you doing? Right. Mm -hmm. We're gonna let them have their moment. Now, what are you doing? Right. Uh, like you can let you can let the people listening come up with. <laughs> let them write their fanfic. Uh, Lee. Lee. We love the you. The call out post for Lee. <laughs> <laughs> AKA, um, what's their username? Star Blaster on Instagram. <laughs> Who wrote the most cursed content? You're <laughs> kidding, Lee. We love you. No less. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Lee. You're the best. Just, just <clears throat> never again. <laughs> um, uh, if you want to talk weird romance, um, where we're at in the Ravnica sub story, 
Mm-hmm. Leona is hitting on herself. Oh. <laughs> well, her alternate world self, yeah. who is also the guild master of the Boros Legion. So only good things can come of that. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I will say one word that will activate a, flight or, a fight or flight response in our listeners. Kismasis. <laughs> ah. <laughs> that, that is a flight word. Flight word. Just, we have just lost people listening, or gotten people incredibly more interested. We don't know yet. Anyway, half of them went nope, and half of them went go on. Exactly. <laughs> Kismasis is the final uh, snap of listener bases. <laughs> but yeah. One of the hardest things, like it's not only you know, plot derailment, but uh, also, I hate when my players fail. Like, it yeah. kills me. Oh. Like, there, there are certain times where it's like, uh, you know, oh my god, you, you failed this thing, but when it's something important and they're really wanting to, like, know what it is, and they're really interested in it, and then they roll a three, it just, it hurts me on the inside a little bit. Yeah, you got to cuz I want I want my my about. players to succeed and I want them to you know yeah like I got to toughen up the, the heart at some a few at yeah. some time I, I, most, yeah most I of the time it's fine but pale. there are there are a few of them when it's like oh you poor baby exactly let oh. me just let me just hug you and then for every one of those uh I'm going to call out somebody uh, who runs Founders of Reka for an episode that isn't out yet but it's just a single joke so it's fine we just recorded one where my character, the fighter, he basically set the, the villain set up a trap to weaken him by using the shadow strength drain. And so mm. it was at that moment my dice decided, hey, B, we're going to like ruin your life. <laughs> and so that happened. And there reached a point where I had to try and defend myself with my greatsword. And I rolled like a, a 10. Mm-hmm. And you just, I was like, yeah, I don't know. And my DM just goes, oh, no, it's really weird. They have, like a, they have 16 AC, but it says if you got a 10, you can hit. And I'm like, <laughs> aha, aha. And he's like, no, seriously, roll damage. And I'm like, wait, are we really going with this? And like, dead ass silent. I'm like, yes, we're going with it. And so I roll damage, thinking like he's just having pity on me. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, seven points of damage. And then he goes, ah, yeah, see, if you roll a 10, though, there's a specific clause where it resists seven points of damage. <laughs> And I was like, you bastard! <laughs> That's pretty good. It was gr- it was hilarious, and it makes for great audio. But it was just it, that was fucking great. Um, My, let's see. I think hmm? that when I make things, like when I run the game, I'm super forgiving until someone hard fails something. Like I will let anything go until someone like messes up. In which case, I will capitalize on that because like failure doesn't come up often in my games which i am not a fan of i like i enjoy watching or not watching people fail that this makes me sound like a sadist i enjoy the drama that comes from people failing right right so i feel like like everyone who plays in the podcast is like their dice must be like blessed i have no idea but like everyone rolls too good it's ridiculous (laughs) Um, it's called cheating. No, they're not <laughs> cheaters. I guarantee you. I hope. I hope they're not. <laughs> I trust them. But like those, like I don't know. I just love capitalizing. It's so. It's it just. It makes everything so much more fun to be like, oh, you messed up. Like if even like if there's ever a time that you roll, if something if you fail, there should be a consequence of that, right? And if you, the same way, if you succeed, there's a consequence of it, right? That's more right. fun for me because I get to think about like, oh, make this roll. And then when they're making the roll, I think in my head, like, not only like, oh, this is how difficult it's going to be, but like, this is what's going to happen if they mess up, right? And that's fun. That makes me. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to continue down the Trials and Trebs one because uh, there's some pretty good ones here and... Sorry about that. I just yeeted my microphone. It's okay. <clears throat> oh, Nathan has a good one. I think we discussed this also a little bit in episode one, but I think it's an okay place to reprieve to reprise it just a little bit. When creating your world and NPC, how do you patient? Uh, in other words, in a world full of tieflings, dragonborns, and half orcs, how do you make sure plenty of experience and identities are represented? Mm-hmm. And we did talk about 
about this a little in our first episode, so I don't want to stay on it too long, but I think uh, I just want to say it's like one of those things where there's always this weird thing about like in books, they always say like you can't just make you can't just like throw stuff at a dartboard and come up with like these identities for your characters, you know mm-hmm. with NPC and an RPG, it's a little more forgiving to do that. Mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, because here's the thing, like a lot of NPCs are important for an arc or a session, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when you have characters like that, at least for Timshul, where it's one big town, spicing up those characters with like, maybe they have, maybe this guy has a husband, maybe, you know what I mean? Like things like that, Mm -hmm. like, while not necessarily... You're not doing it for any other reason than because you want to and because you think it's important to show that this stuff is normal in the world, you know? I think when you're doing, like, smaller scale NPCs, just throwing those in isn't that bad of a thing, and it just makes the world more inclusive, feel bigger, you know? Right. I took a a, a more, um... I took, I guess, a different route. Um, I mean, I've talked about this before, but uh, the world of Adrian is not like typical Euro fantasy esque. It's mm-hmm. a vibrant place with cultural influences from all over the real world. So, like, um, I went ahead and just reworked pretty much all of the species. Like, the the uh, the elves, the elven culture is very like Middle Eastern cradle of civilization type. Like, think the Islamic Golden Age. Mm-hmm. That's what the elven, uh, the major elven uh, nations are like, um, and the orcs. Um, I completely reworked the orcs, and they're essentially. Um, I I t- did away with all like the bad tropes of like you know orcs are angry, stupid brutes, and instead they are a uh, proud, uh, very creative and clever uh, race of islander folk. Uh, inspired by um, the cultures of Polynesia and uh, the South Pacific. Um, and so having a bunch of NPCs from these different races with all these different cultural backgrounds, um, it's just, it makes the world seem bigger, in my yeah. humble mm-hmm. opinion. Yeah. And like the thing about having these representative faces in your storytelling is, like, I mean, also your players are surprisingly a great like resource for that representation because mm-hmm. a lot of your players want to play represent, and <clears throat> that well, gives you if you have groups like us at least yeah if yeah. you have, if you have groups like ours you have like like Rowan is bi and Shira is ace there's like a lot of different sexualities gender identities that are just represented naturally through the players mm-hmm. and yeah. like. That's great. And the thing is, you get to like bounce off of what your players have with the bigger world, and that's awesome. And I mean, like, Tim Schull has a has like a, a, a set as like the place where everyone is welcome, you know? And so just naturally, it makes sense to do, you know, it makes sense to just have rant, like times where you know, a character pops in who is LGBT, or yeah. one of these characters just, like, casually is referred to with they-them pronouns. Like, that stuff is normalized in Timshul, and I think that's what makes me happy. It, it, it's the normalization of it, you know? Yeah, it's, it's something that in our society today is not as normal. Like, it's not considered normal, but in these worlds that we create, we can make it normal. Mm-hmm. And exactly. like in in uh, space days, we we represent the uh, LGBTQ plus community a lot. Uh, Botches has two fathers. You know, there's mm-hmm. uh, NPCs that are are single parents. There are adopted. There are, you know, uh, like uh, veterans, like war veterans. There mm-hmm. are all sorts of different things that you would find in the real world that have become a, like a normal thing in these worlds. And that's, 
that's one thing that's really cool is when you get to see your how your characters uh and your players like interact with these people Mm -hmm. my problem though is i when i create npcs i get way too invested in them and they get backstories like (laughs) detailed backstories and i love all of my npcs and i will protect them with my life it's fair uh is that where we oh uh we talked about this what do you do when it's clear the players are about to head the direction you are not prepared for from Lucasite. And I think we've touched on that mm. on and off. And it's mostly just grin and bear it. <laughs> yeah. Like, I you just, just, re, just retool it. Yeah, it's so fun. Yes. There, are the time, there, have been, the there have been games of, of the Frostwalkers where I've walked in like, plan? What plan? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I don't know about you guys. I don't know how, about, how other folks um, prepare. I never prepare. I'm a trash dialogue writer, which if you ever listen to any of the podcasts and listen to me talk as an NPC, it is very obvious that I am trash at writing dialogue, both beforehand and like improvised dialogue. Um, But like actions and things that can happen. Like I, if I ever shared my notes, it would be like, oh, wow, a lot of that stuff just never existed in the notes like that's part of the fun for me is just something will pop into my head as we're playing and then i'll be able to just introduce it as if it was always supposed to be that way like that's oh, the fun I of it is like that dm magic of like what are you talking about this is always what i planned to happen this is exactly <laughs> how i planned this mm-hmm. and you don't know any better exactly <laughs> you 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 did exactly what i expected you to do meanwhile you're like holy shit what am i supposed to do right now this is all going to hell Right, like I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, (laughs) you have the calm exposure on the outside of like, uh, oh yes, and and on the inside you're like, fuck shit, fuck shit, fuck shit. What do I do? You're the the dog comic in a burning building. This is fine. This is fine. (laughs) (sighs) Yeah, that's that's Uh. DMing. That like here's the thing. People always like say that that's like the biggest scariest thing about it, and it is the first time. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. then it happens grin and bear it and then you go yeah. it's like a shot it's like it's like when you get a shot when you're like three it's yeah. the worst thing in the universe and then it happens and then you're just like that wasn't that bad you, you cry for a couple minutes and then you're done yeah exactly and then like an accurate summation of dming exactly yeah. you <laughs> cry a couple minutes and then you're done and then you That's... get a lollipop <laughs> exactly oh, i wish people gave me a lollipop when we finished playing oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 players of Trials and Trebuchets, the Frostwalkers, uh, 20SA, 20SA, and and the Escape Artists, donate food. <laughs> just, just give us snacks. That's all we need. When we yeah. have to play in person. Also, Jason, make your guac before we start the fucking session. <laughs> <laughs> when we used to always play in person, my group of players and I, um, we would always, it was it was like potluck style for like the first couple weeks when we were like oh let's all do this and then it slowly became two of us me and like one other person bringing food and then we would just like order chicken tenders midway through the game and like sit around and eat chicken tenders for like an hour and it was like this is foolishness i always well, i was always in the impression like oh people should be giving me food because we're because i'm running this game for them and that has never once been proven true it's never happened yep yeah oh it's happened <laughs> well you're lucky you've gotten food lance i uh, have there was a one point where i was like yeah i'm dming uh bring whatever food you want and like they showed up one of them brought me a giant bag of reese's like oh peanut butter cups the gosh. other one brought me like a soda and an energy drink another one brought me chips and they're like this is just for you and i'm like oh, huh so kind. i feel like a god <laughs> Yes. I have power. Give me your offerings. <laughs> the last time I did a campaign or like a campaign finale, which was a bit over a year ago, um, was like the last time, like it was the la- just the last session. And so I was like, oh, you guys don't need to worry about bringing food. I'll just cook everything. And so I just made some like, I made like fried pastries and like pulled pork with bread and buns no. and stuff and coleslaw. And it was just Holy like, fuck. let's have a fun barbecue with like some fried foods. And like- See- See, I love extra campaign. Like, this is probably not what you were intending, but mm-hmm. I love extra, like, out of campaign character work. 
Like oh. one of the things that is my favorite that is possibly brewing for founders of Reka, but I really like I am gonna vocally pitch this on the episode. I wanna do I don't know how like I've brought it up in passing. My childhood Disney movies and Mystery mm-hmm. Science Theater three thousand. Mm-hmm. Which is a great show, yes. which is just watching shitty movies yes. and laughing about it. And m- I, my brain is just gravitating towards like, okay, but do that, but in character. That would be crazy. I would love that. But like extra campaign stuff, like even like just getting food after your session, because you're already still riding that high of a campaign. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, like stuff like that to me makes like a world of difference. It's not exactly out of character. I don't think entirely, but it was, we were chatting one night in our private group chat about just general stuff, minutia, like administrative, like things. And then all of a sudden, one of my players, Sarah, was like, blah, 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 making memes about how much she had a crush on an NPC. And I was just like, where did this come from? Like, literally not once when we were playing, did she ever reference like, oh, this person's cool. Or like, wow, I have a crush on this person. But it was literally like a week later in our group chat at like 1130 at night, just like three memes about how much she had a crush on her. And I was like, this is interesting. And since then, it's again, devolved into people always just like role playing, or not entirely role playing, but like they constantly talk about their characters in private. And then like things happen in the podcast and it's like, you guys, please, you can't just talk in private about these things. You need to, like, say them on air. Yeah, yep, yep. Right, I get that. Mm-hmm. So That's, like, God, one of the yeah. major differences between, like, recording and playing at home. Like, if we were playing at home, it, it's like, oh, yeah, let's just chat about, this is my character stuff, and oh, da 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 But And like, that's just canon, yeah. Yeah, but here it makes it harder, I guess. Like, it's still, mm-hmm. I think it's still fine to, like, we made an Instagram post on our thing yesterday, and one of our players, Carla, um, made like a whole blurb about like part of her character's backstory and little it was just a tiny little thing about like oh this is what childhood thing was and that stuff like that's fine but like to develop like to just randomly develop feelings outside of a session i was like this is interesting and a very (laughs) novel thing yeah see Uh... i have the similar problem where like uh, my players make jokes and memes and shit about talk just talk Mm-hmm. talk the talk about their characters in discord and and uh via our instagram group chat and it's just fucking hilarious and i keep saying save it for the podcast yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh my um thing. if you look my, in yep. in our server we have a channel called the elder scroll where all of our legendary quotes go <laughs> and um one of the things that i mean this is just we were talking about world building and i mentioned oh there's a sea in the southern hemisphere of this world that's completely landlocked and it doesn't have whales it's called the bit in the local tongue it's called the sea with a conspicuous lack of whales mm-hmm. and, <laughs> and then my players started going okay well we you know we have to bring the whales in i'm like no that's not no i refuse to <laughs> and finally i'm like no okay this instead of whales the sea has giant like whale like walruses mm. and one of my players goes ah so it's a whole sea of Jamie Heidemans, and everyone <laughs> lost their fucking minds. <laughs> no! <laughs> and then, oh, this is it. All right, so it was October. This is just after I'd opened the server. Jason, who plays the necromancer Saturn Dolorem, says, Saturn just T-poses and hums the Halo theme whenever he uses Animate Dead. Oh my god. So this is canon, but it didn't happen in the show. Yeah. So now this is just the thing that has to happen on the show without the context of him saying that. I know. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. I have, a, I have one last question on the Trials and Trebuchets server, and I think there's one or two more in the Frostwalkers. <laughs> last question in Trials and Trebuchets for Luke. When deciding whether or not to put trades in your world, how oh did you come God. to the conclusion to exclude them? Like, why? What did trades ever do to you? <laughs> so, for context... There was a single episode where I made a comment about life jackets and an absence of trains, to which one of my astute players made the comment, but life jackets were invented after trains, Luke. So that's stupid. There should be trains in this universe. (laughs) And um, since then, I've been assaulted 
or like uh, with- die daily <laughs> yes but, so, like every single time i look at the server like every single morning i read through messages and like it'll be like there's always at least one if not like a ton of people just being like why is there no trains luke fucking <laughs> uh, add elevators in your fantasy world we have like lifts but like there's no like i don't know i just i have some an idea no trains for something in the future and I've That's made it fair. very clear to my players and our fans, there's an idea I have for something that is going to happen in the future. And it's more technologically advanced than trains, but like trains can exist around that era too. So like 200 years from when the campaign is set now, sure, trains can exist, but like it's not something I sat down and made the freaking world setting. I was like, no trains. Like I made a conscious decision about the technology in the setting. Right. But- of course. Include absence of trains. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the thing, though. Uh, different different worlds will definitely have different technological developments. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. perfectly reasonable for life jackets to have been being invented before exactly. trains. Yeah. Especially since, um, like, if if your world is highly, you know, marine focused, mm-hmm. then yeah, obviously they're going to invent yeah. life jackets before they invent fucking trains. Trains have no place on the beach. Um, <laughs> No trains on the so beach. Much. No trains on the beach. Um, <laughs> but like, I had this. I had a challenge when I was doing a test session. Actually, when my player. Um, so for reference, in the test session, I put them through a puzzle dungeon in the first room. Mm-hmm. The room, the door slams behind them. The room starts to fill with water, and the first thing out of Jason's mouth was, "I rolled to drink it." <laughs> And so I had a brief existential crisis over whether or not this world had figured out that, you know, germs exist and how to treat those. Mm -hmm. Um, But then, um, funny enough, on the topic of trains, in in episode one, I mentioned, oh, yeah, in the capital city of this empire, there is a train that goes around the city. Mm -hmm. Um, So that exists. Um, And... I still don't have like a solid uh I still don't have a solid idea of like where exactly Technoculture is, but that's part of the beauty yeah. of playing is like you get to figure the shit out as you go along. Yeah. Yeah, everything's everything is fluid until you say it, right? Like even for like NPCs and stuff. Like I can write down as much as I want about a person's character or like the setting itself but if we start playing and someone asks me a question and i just offhandedly make a remark that just has to be the truth now and everything else kind of fits around that oh right? yeah i yeah. um it, i actually ran the same puzzle dungeon for um a group of the frost walkers just off off air mm-hmm. just for fun and i accidentally canonized fantasy osha oh nice <laughs> 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 I don't remember when it was, but someone said something about like, oh, the fantasy police are, or the magic police are going to get you. And then in my notebook, I was like, magical police? Question mark. So like, I don't, I, th- I don't think they understand how strong of an impact. Like, I don't think players understand how strong of an impact they have upon the world. Like, it's like not the like, shit they say. Yeah. Yeah. Like none of this exists until I say it. So like, when you say something and it gets in my head, I'm gonna put it in the setting. Right. Oh yeah, we did. Um... um... I, I was on World Anvil months ago with some mm-hmm. folks, and we were just um, shooting the shit. And we did this thing where we we're like, "Okay, why don't we just play around in each other's worlds?" And you know, yeah, basically some impromptu mm-hmm. RP stuff. And I was describing the, the main tavern chain, which is um, for those of you who don't remember, Long Dong Silvers. Um, <laughs> and I offhandedly described it as like a mix between like you know a fantasy tavern um a waffle house and a, a burger king and one of the one of the folks asked oh so does it serve waffles or burgers and i said both and one of the other guys said so they serve waffle burgers and i wrote it down in my notes then and there yeah. everyone <laughs> lost their shit and i wrote it down like all right this is canon they serve waffle yeah. burgers <laughs> that's what makes the game fun though is that Agreed. everyone gets to have an impact Agreed. We had, uh, we had something like that happen in one of our campaigns where it was uh, they wanted they asked if there was any fast food in this mm. fantasy thing, and we had been watching those uh, Subway mm. videos on YouTube, and so I was like, "Yes, there's a Subway," <laughs> <laughs> and 
and they're like Ooh. animated james wants their royalties <laughs> yep i know <laughs> and they're like oh what kind of meat is there and i'm like oh you know <laughs> there's your there's your normal meat there's you know chicken bacon <laughs> purple worm <laughs> and they're like wait 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 purple worm and i'm like yeah it's subway you have it your way <laughs> and like very taking good. life experiences like we we went to a convention and we were at subway and this guy he kept asking like you know he, he would ask everybody what kind of cheese do you want and it got to my turn and i was like you know he's like what kind of cheese do you want and i was like oh can i get pepper jack and he's like oh we don't have pepper jack okay can i get cheddar oh we don't have cheddar what the fuck they only had like one type of cheese left but he was so into this like loop of asking what kind of cheese mm -hmm. do you want You're so, so that happened this, yeah he that happened in the subway and i think i broke kaz when i said it because i was like what kind of cheese do you want they're like, uh, cheddar, please. And I'm like, oh, we don't have any cheddar. <laughs> <laughs> and they just um, died because they were right behind me. And he had actually asked them right after me, what kind of cheese do you want? Yeah. And they're like, um, <laughs> I guess the only one you have left. <laughs> so good. Uh, I subscribe to the Griffin McElroy logic of if you put the word fantasy in front of it, it's fair game. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Fantasy OSHA. Prime example. Fantasy. Yeah. <clears throat> if you just slap the word fantasy in front of it, I have to let it slide. Fantasy American <laughs> cheese made in fantasy Wisconsin. <laughs> now now see we we uh we put we changed the names just slightly and on, on Thibus it always starts with D. Mm -hmm. So we have Dungum Fighters, <laughs> we have Duber, we <laughs> have Dougal, Dougal. We have... <laughs> with D mail. We have uh, <laughs> we have Dokadola. I fucking love Dokadola. It's the funniest <laughs> shit I've ever heard in my life. Dougal Plus. <laughs> Dougal Drive. You Dougal know. Drive. Check out this dap I downloaded from the Dougal Play Store. God yep. damn it, Luke! <laughs> Instagram. Okay. I guess. I guess. God damn it, Duke. <laughs> Ditter, you know. Ditter. Ditter. <laughs> I don't want to be on Ditter. <laughs> but what about Discord? Discord already starts oh, with a D. Damn. Discord is just no. canon. Holy fuck, Discord is just canon. I think this is a great <laughs> spot to end the episode. <laughs> existential crisis over Discord. Discord. <laughs> no, see, uh, Discord on Thibus is just called Chaos. <laughs> <laughs> You're correct. Did you mean the entire planet? <laughs> You are correct, sir. Oh my god. I don't think anything can beat this conversation. I don't That's think we can yeah. I don't think I don't think we can say anything to top that. <sighs> okay. With that in mind, that's all the questions of the trials at Trebuchet server. Uh, it, it, the 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 question part just continues to talk about big horse. Yeah. <laughs> Trains and big horse. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Horse lobbyists. They're they're everywhere. So mm. everyone use Dougal, beware big horse, and uh let your cat slap your microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and That's I think right. Yep. And then you'll be great at Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> yes. That is how you become a good DM. Yep. That is how you DM. Yep. Uh all right, everyone. Uh this was really fun. Thank um, you all for having me. Yeah, oh, thanks, really Lance, for having me. This was really fun. Did you just say thanks, Lance? You know what? <laughs> I you just thank yourself. yourself. <laughs> I'm you just thank yourself. yourself. I did. Okay, well, no, I'm looking at a, I'm looking at a uh, a conversation, and they were saying my name over and over, and I was so sitting there, I was like, I wanted to say Luke, and I've been drinking too many imaginary drinks for this early in the morning. <laughs> so thank you, Luke. Also thank myself, and thanks, thank Lance, for Lance. and. Thank Lance for Lance. <laughs> Thank Lance for Lance. I need a nap. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right, everyone. Um, 
Luke, one last time, if you want to just last minute uh, tell everyone where you can find your show. Trials and Trebuchets with an ampersand on anywhere that you get podcasts and trial at Trials and Trebs on Instagram. There's a fancy new search function on Discord where you can search for servers. So if you search that great name, Trials and Trebuchets, uh, you'll find us. Come on over. It's super I fun. I didn't know that's a thing. It is. It's like super new. I don't know how well it works, but it's a thing. It's pretty- yeah, I, I found it only works with games, though. Oh, that oh. sucks. Uh, there's probably, you'll probably have links everywhere. And we'll, we'll yeah. put a link to your server at the end of, in the episode's oh, so minutia. <clears throat> yeah. All right, everyone. This was really fun. Uh, hopefully by the time you hear this, we'll have it on a separate locale than just the Frostwalker stream. Uh, that'd be really cool. Um, we've been talking about <laughs> some other really fun things we're going to be doing through DMs fairly soon. More guests, more time with just us. and maybe a few dm one shots <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> for now we will end this conversation before we say more disastrous things that get before us kicked off the internet so hard i puke <laughs> <laughs> i'm right. just gonna thank myself again <laughs> <laughs> i am a great man and i would just like to thank myself for being here Glad you- i'd like to thank the academy <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank I'd like to thank the fa- uh, everyone for being here. I'd like to thank myself for for surviving this long, and um, I'd like to thank Animated James for not suing Lance yet. <laughs> hey, hey, uh, it wasn't it wasn't recorded, and I made no profit off of it, and I'm a fair. huge fan. So. <laughs> All right, everyone. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.